Is it easy like, to communicate with uh, Russian? It's probably true of Russian culture that people are a little more open. You have much more real deadlines. The faster you produce that work, um, the more money your company gets. Всем привет! Добро пожаловать на канал Проблог ТВ и в Кремниевую долину. Меня зовут Вика. Рядом со мной Эндрю. Он американец. Привет. Программист. Немного говорит по-русски. Но сегодня мы поговорим о его работе и будем говорить по-английски. Я надеюсь, это натренирует ваш слух и будет полезным для вас. Но если вы не уверенно себя чувствуете в английском, то включайте субтитры и читайте русский перевод. Hi, Andrew. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. So, let's talk about your uh, work experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, I prefer to start with uh, yeah. your education. Mm -hmm. I know that you graduated from Penn University. Penn State, yeah. Penn, Penn, State. Penn State University. Is yeah. it like prestigious one? Or? Um, so, I'd say in America that most of our state universities aren't considered, generally speaking, prestigious. Uh, but Uh, of the state universities, Penn State is considered to be one of the better ones. Um, it's not considered as prestigious as an Ivy League school like Harvard or some such. And there are also other private universities like uh, non-Ivy League private universities like MIT that are considered sort of much more prestigious. So I'd say it kind of falls like at the top of the bottom, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. um, in some senses of the, of the scale. Yeah, but I wouldn't say that it's like a particularly prestigious university. Okay, uh, what's your major? Ah, so when I studied there, I studied information science technology, and I studied a second major, which is security and risk analysis. Um, mm. So information science technology is more like studying how we can use IT solutions to treat business problems and security and risk analysis is more like studying how we can use mm, statistics and some event modeling to predict things like uh, different types of security events. So an example might be like a terrorist attack or something mm. um, and to be able to prevent that. What was your favorite classes? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I hadn't really thought about it much. The, I know this is going to sound like so funny coming from an American, but there's a class on counterterrorism that I took as a 200 level course in security and risk analysis. And that class was very interesting. Um, we studied several sort of books that had been written at that point. This is back in about 2010 when I took the class. Um, so as you know, back in 2001, there was 9-11 and there was this big uh, sort of war that was started in the Middle East. America was involved, Australia was involved, all of the allies of America were involved, Britain, um, New Zealand. An Australian uh, soldier wrote this like pretty long book about all the things that we were doing there that weren't working. And effectively, uh, most of the strategy that we had wasn't working, so we read into this book kind of at length, and we learned a lot about how certain kinds of strategies for counterterrorism were really ineffective and how some strategies for counterterrorism could be improved in ways that actually benefited the people that live there. So mm -hmm. the idea, the central idea being that if you uh, kill a terrorist, that person's, you know, brother, father, uncle, son, sister, all of them are suddenly motivated to become, you know, terrorists because they want revenge. So the mm -hmm. idea being that like, killing people is not an effective way to deal with terrorism. And so this led to a bunch of new strategies like providing healthcare or uh, a police force or a court system, things like this, um, to be able to prevent uh, a terrorist organization from taking over a country, essentially. Wow, it's so. interesting. It's interesting in the context that you, uh, that you um, worked for a Palantir. Yeah. But we will talk about it later. Yeah. yeah. Do you know how many of your co-workers graduated from prestigious universities like Stanford mm. and MIT or something like that? Yeah, so I think a lot of them did. Um, When I was working at Palantir, there's this, there was this moment where um, I was sitting in a room with... It was kind of late, it was after work, and I don't think that they knew that I was really there because it was quite a large area, an open space uh, with lots of desks. And I was working sort of quietly in the corner, and I overheard two people on the other side of the room reviewing sort of like candidate applications um, for Palantir, and they were looking at resumes, 
and they were kind of like making fun of the school that someone had graduated from. And I sort of knew which schools they had gone to because it's a common uh, thing for people to bring up, like as new graduates coming out of university, going to uh, a new company for the first time, uh, as I was when I went to Palantir, it comes up in conversation a lot. So I sort of knew that they had gone to more prestigious universities like a Stanford or a Harvard or something similar like this. And to hear them making fun of that really like kind of insulted me a little bit, but I got over it. Um, I think that a lot of the candidates that end up getting hired by these companies do come from prestigious universities. I think having that on your resume helps a lot, but it's not the only way to get hired. So. It's helped a lot in uh, the beginning of career, or mm. oh, you think uh, it's always like help? It's a good question. I don't think my career is quite long enough yet to know for sure. Yeah, I feel like in the beginning of the career it probably helps more because you can get into a good company, and then by being at a good company early on, later down the road when you go to work at other companies, if they know the reputation of that company as being very, very good, then it's very easy to get a job at other companies down the line. Uh, and mm -hmm. So it kind of it kind of carries on, carries forward in some oh, sense. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I don't know if it has like a long-term impact or if it's just short-term. You moved to Silicon Valley, right? Mm -hmm. Like three years ago or maybe yeah, more? Yeah, three, three or four. Yeah, it's yeah. coming up on like four. Actually. What was the reason? Like So I finished my education. I mm -hmm. applied for jobs at a bunch of different companies. Um, some of them were, were very like sort of orthodox, like I just filled out an application online and like sent it. Uh, some of them were very unorthodox. Uh, there was a company in Pennsylvania, a tech company called Monetate, that I, I sort of walked into their office there uh, one day and they didn't have like a front desk person. It was a kind of a smaller startup at the time that I'd heard about um, through I think Hacker News or something. And so I just walked into their office and I, and I asked if I, I, I told them that, you know, I'd read about their product and I thought it was interesting and I just graduated in engineering and I just wanted to interview someone on their engineering side of the house and talk to them about like what they were making. And at the end of that sort of conversation that I had with them, um, they actually invited me to come interview with them uh, after that mm -hmm. conversation. So I'd never provided them with an application or a resume or anything. It was kind of just like a, but the whole process for me from the beginning had been because I'd been interested in like getting a job eventually. So yeah. I think that there are alternative methods to getting sort of like your foot in the door. Um, but I came to Silicon Valley because I'd been hired by Palantir. I'd signed a, um, a contract with them to come out and work. And I mean, that's more or less, yeah, why I came out. Why did I get a job here isn't a question you asked, but uh, I, I was interested in this place because as a new graduate, the salaries on paper look higher. Um, you don't realize at that time, maybe, that the cost of living is also much higher, yeah. unless you're familiar with the industry a little more. But So that was part of the lure, part of the attraction. But also this is where all of the software engineering of kind of like America happens. It's a very concentrated location. You know, you go out on weekends and you hang out and engineers are talking about engineering things. So you get this depth of expertise that sort of percolates in like a, a sense through all of the people yeah. um, in Silicon Valley. I know that uh, Palantir is a very famous uh, company here in Silicon Valley, but in Russia almost nobody knows no. anything about uh, this company. Could you say <laughs> what they do? Yeah, I, so I think it's probably, probably intentional on Palantir's part that not too many people outside of the area kind of know what they do. Um, it's, it's, so they're not terribly secretive, but they don't really do much PR. Um, mm -hmm. So Palantir is a company that produces software that's used by analysts, uh, primarily agents who work for either government or private organizations who are analyzing some data-centric uh, problem. And the problem is usually related to something organizational. So what I mean by that is there is an organization like a terrorist group or a criminal gang or um, in some cases, a family of like pharmaceutical chemicals that are similar, like different kinds of organizations can exist. And there's an analyst that's sort of trying to solve some problem they have about that. So an example of this might be someone looking for um, some kind of like fraudulent activity of some kind, someone looking for some kind of criminal activity or a relationship between two things, uh, someone looking for maybe a common pharmaceutical that uh, two other pharmaceuticals are similar to and therefore like sort of realizing that they can use maybe this other one as a substitute. Um, so I think it has a lot of different use cases, uh, but that's their primary product is this analytical software. What was your project? Oh, my project. Yeah. So 
when I worked at Palantir, I worked on a platform uh, primarily, well, I worked on a couple different projects, but most of my time there was spent working on a platform for sharing data between organizations and then updating it independently of those organizations and merging those updates back together later. For the particular types of data we were pushing around, this is a little difficult, um, but I mean, you know, it's, it's an interesting system to work on. It was an interesting project to work on. There were a lot of distributed consistency problems. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was kind of fun. Let's talk about organization of um, interviewing process in mm -hmm. uh, Palantir. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what the first? Uh, Recruiters okay. call and then? Mm -hmm. So uh, usually there's some reveal process internal to the recruiting department where they produce sort of like a name. They send that name over to the engineering department and it comes with like, you know, a phone number and maybe like a, a schedule for when we should phone interview that person. That, that's when we first see this person, but before that, they've already done like one phone screen with recruiting, um, and their maybe resume and everything has already been reviewed by recruiting. So once we get their name and their information, we're doing a second phone screen, uh, which is where we sit down with them and we go over uh, in detail maybe a few different coding problems, or maybe um, maybe they've done some coding challenge online. Uh, it depends on sort of the the structure for the team. Um, I know in in some of the orgs there it's a little bit different and for some of the roles it's a little bit different because we have multiple engineering roles but they go through that phone interview process and then they come for an on-site which is usually uh, five or six interviews during the day in the old days the last interview of the day would have been meeting with one of the founders but uh, obviously as the company's grown that's become impossible to do for every candidate coming through the yeah. pipeline so uh, that no longer happens I think but uh, five or six interviews during the day where of those most of them are little challenge question type things some of them relate to coding on a whiteboard some of them do not and they're just sort of like thought problems or design problems something like this mm -hmm. okay you say that you never uh interviewed um uh, russian, russian candidate yeah yeah i don't know explain it you work with uh, oh, some yeah. of them yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and um how they're like do they different uh uh, in work, like, I mean, in, com in communication? Yes and no. So I think, American. Yeah, like, I think people from different places do have a little bit of influence, maybe, from their, like, where their, their home culture um, on their behaviors. Uh, yeah. A little bit, a little bit. So, as an example, I think, so the programmers I've met from Russia, yeah. Um, most of them are like way better at mathematics than this sort of standard American programmer that I've met. I, I don't, you know, maybe it's the education system is different. I don't really know why. But um, from that sort of same background, I'd say mathematicians that I've met who are American or German or Russian or whatever, um, all of those people as a group have like a few traits in common that I, I sort of would attribute sort of generally to Russian programmers as well, uh, which is that they they tend to sort of not try as hard to make you believe something that they want you to believe necessarily. Uh, like if they know it's true, like they're satisfied with knowing themselves kind of. Um, in some senses, they'll put together sort of an idea or a solution for a problem. And they'll say like, this is a solution. It's an idea, like here it is. Um, but they don't tend to sort of try and like make it seem like it's particularly ingenious or anything. They don't go above and beyond to try and um, make you believe that it's more than it is, which is, I think, I think that's pretty characteristic of people who are well-educated in math, honestly, uh, which, I mean, Russian people that I've met who are engineers tend to be well-educated in math. So. But what about communication? Is it easy like, to communicate with uh, Russian language -wise, uh, software? Not or? language, I mean, uh, like, um, we always think that uh, American they are like mm, have a long distance between mm. each other. Mm -hmm. But uh, what about work communication? Mm -hmm. So I think it's pretty easy. Like at least for me, maybe less easy for other people. I don't know. It, I guess it depends on the person because so in America there's a lot of stereotypes, and mm -hmm. because we have people coming from every country in the world. There's a tendency for different countries to be stereotyped in different ways, yeah. but also for Americans to sort of, like some Americans in this sense stereotype people less, but some of them in this sense from the same stimulus stereotype people more. I think it's really hard 
to say whether this is true generally, but I think that like communication, I don't know, it comes down to how their English is for the most part. Um, there's usually not confusion over facts, like that doesn't really happen. Um, other types of miscommunication, like uh, intending to communicate like some particular thing and accidentally communicating something else, like like your opinion about something. I don't know. It doesn't happen as much. So I think communication's probably pretty good, actually. Do they rough in meeting or no? <laughs> oh, you mean like? Uh, oh, I, yeah. I think I think people. Yeah. So I think generally speaking, people who are speaking a second language, mm -hmm. so not their first language, tend to be more direct yeah. about everything, and I think. I think, yeah, it's probably true of Russian culture that people are a little more open about how they feel about something. Mm -hmm. um, I think Americans tend to like hide it a little more. Like You can, um, you can like, um, compare, it, uh, for example, Asian people and Russian, and, and maybe mm -hmm. Indian people. Uh, <laughs> can you say the difference between connection, uh, connecting with them? I mean, I think I interviewed three candidates from India recently at the company I work at mm -hmm. and I interviewed one from China. They all seemed like, I wouldn't say that there was anything like particularly common about those candidates that was identifiable as like a particularly Indian characteristic. I do feel like some cultures are more direct. I like, they're just more sort of to the point, um, which I mean in America we'll tend to like talk around a subject and then yeah. sort of circle around until we get to it. and that that's comfortable for us uh it's it's it wastes a lot of time i think in some ways but it, it's i don't know it's kind of like this it's just what we grow up doing i think in some senses but i think in some ways like other cultures can be more direct um i wouldn't i can't say that it's particularly like russian people or particularly like some other group of people um because it, it depends on who i've met i guess like mm -hmm. the particular people i've met from Russia tend to be a little more direct. Yeah. I mean, uh, Katya included, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, Katya is my wife. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I think, I mean, she's like sort of direct and honest with me, which I really appreciate. Whereas the, I wouldn't necessarily say that's true for every person I've met um, in America. Like if you invite someone over for dinner and they don't like the taste of food, I feel like if it was somebody who had grown up in America, they would have a tendency to sort of like say, oh yeah, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Whereas a Russian person would say, honestly, like this doesn't taste very good, do you have something else? Like, really? <laughs> maybe, yeah, I think that might happen, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Andrew, no for the interview. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for interviewing me. Спасибо, Andrew. Спасибо. Спасибо ты. Да, тебе. Тебе. А, тебе? Спасибо тебе. И спасибо вам за то, что вы досмотрели это видео. Я надеюсь, что оно вам понравилось. Спрашивайте в комментариях, если у вас есть какие-то вопросы. Я думаю, что Эндрюс туда заглянет и, возможно, даст ответы. На этом все. Подписывайтесь на канал. Всем пока. Пока.